welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me as always, Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. And I had the pleasure of spending three hours with him this morning. So plenty of plenty of Mark Ainley in my life today. I know, I know. So that means we'll send probably um, over, over four hours today and that'll be kind of like a record for a single day. Uh, even, I, even recording back-to-back podcasts a couple of times, we still never achieved that. So big day, man. Whew, it's a good one. So, um, but yeah, you, you went, you know, networking, networking, networking. So that, that's why we're all here. Uh, we're here to learn stuff and we're here to grow our network. You went to a networking event last night. T- talk to us about uh, how that went. Good vibes. Uh, we're recording this mid January. I was at the uh, Chicago multifamily meetup last night. So our friends, uh, Jenny and Greg, I believe episode 82, I looked it up and forgot to write it down, but I know we've, we've had them on the podcast before. They were talking about their ground up development over in, uh, the corner of Avondale and Logan square. You've probably seen Instagram post on that. But they did a phenomenal job. It was uh, it's January, so it's just like going to the gym in January. Everyone's excited. There's a uh, there's, there's a plethora of people. There's probably fifty or sixty people packed in there. So great event, great great job by all. And also another shout out, uh, Zach Posey will be uh, now helping lead the Chicago Chicago multifamily meetup. So stepping a little bit of a leadership role for him. So that's exciting. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, no, we that uh, network event's always uh, been a good one, and uh, excited about uh, just going to more of those events this year. I think you and me were talking about it this morning, just getting out there more and, and, and talking to people. And, and if anything, we can find more guests that way too. So. Yeah, it's all good stuff. So, you know, coming in hot, what, uh, what, what do you have for the housing provider tip of the week? So this is something I stumbled upon and I don't know if you know, it exists, but for all you short-term renters or people that want to potentially have that as an option, there's literally on the city of Chicago website, and we'll link to this in the show notes, there's a prohibited building list that uh, does not allow it. So if you are an HOA, so this is another angle too. So if you are an HOA or you're an HOA uh, uh, within on an HOA board, you want to add your property to this list, you can add your building to this list. And if someone goes to apply for short-term licensing, the city will not allow you to get it. Now, if you're doing your due diligence and maybe you want to consider short-term uh, renting or Airbnb or whatever, uh, you can look on this list and see if a property, you know, it's hard sometimes to call HOAs and get the answers or get the firm things, but if this building's on the list, you're not going to be able to do that. So we'll put the link here in show notes and, uh, you guys could check that out as part of your due diligence for when you're buying something. Nice. And, and the, from the legality perspective, I believe it's episode 143 with Jessica Ryan. Yes. The ins yes. and outs of navigating Chicago short-term rentals. Look at us. Yeah, she did reference that list on there and uh, in, in hindsight, but uh, I came across it through another podcast the other day and, and I pulled it up and it's pretty cool. Cool little tool. Nice. Cool. Let's let's jump in here. All right. We, we got a, a friend of the show here today. We got a, a GC client, a, a neighbor to our building. He's been out to dinner with us a couple of times. We, we've uh, got to hang out with him. But uh, today, today's guest is entrepreneur, real estate investor, and accountant born and bred here in the Chicagoland area with 20 years of franchise experience, which we're going to talk about here today because I really enjoy his story. Um, you know, He's also been a tax advisor as well. So Mike offers a well-rounded perspective to both personal and professional clients. He invests mainly in attached single family in the Northwest suburbs as an investor. But like I said, he's in a tax advisor and we're getting into accounting season and we want to uh, talk about some of the ins and outs that you have to be considering here in the upcoming weeks and months. So uh, without uh, further ado, Mike Procaccio, welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, the name, you know, as is, 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 is much as it's pretty easy to say, I always slow down at the end and get all nervous about butcher names. I know you do too, Tom. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's better than pistachio, which is what everyone calls it anyway. So, oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's fun too. Um, so before we dig in, you, you're, you have franchises, you know, you've, yeah. you've been out uh, to uh, to interview and we've picked your brain on what it's like and, and you, you have two Jimmy John's uh, franchises, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So me and Tom, we just, we came up with this question earlier because we were just kind of curious. What is the one sandwich that you do not like? <laughs> I, let's see. I would yeah, say- throw shade at one of the Jimmy John sandwiches. <laughs> it, it, I think it's off the menu now. It was the number 13, the gourmet veggie. It was like eight pieces of cheese and avocado. It was very, it was a lot. So it, was, <laughs> it was more unhealthy than the actual gargantuan. So we didn't sell too many of them. They kicked it off the menu. And uh, now they have a spicy East Coast Italian in its place, I believe. So, nice. yeah, yeah, that one's actually pretty good. I, I've had that one. That's kind of yeah. been my new go-to one. Oh yeah, <laughs> like that. All right, before we get too hungry, we'll, we'll keep moving on. But I want to, I want to just go down the franchise uh, yeah. option, even though it's a real estate show. But I, I know, you know, any of these yourself, any most people listening, or some they got this entrepreneur blood flowing through, and 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 uh, mm-hmm. franchise is always a, is an attractive 
uh, path to research. So you, uh, at a young age dove into franchises. Tell us kind of your mindset at that age and, and why you found it attractive. Well, first of all, I, I like the product, you know, Jimmy John's great sandwich. I went there all throughout high school and college. And, um, you know, when my dad was like, you know, I originally told him I didn't want to be in the accounting business and he's like, okay, but whatever you do, you need to be in business for yourself. And I was like, all right. So I went to college. There's a Jimmy John's like a block from my apartment. And that's so why I worked there for two years, realized, you know, I can do this. You know, it's not rocket science. You can wear a t-shirt and shorts to work every day. And I was like, all right. So I went down that path, um, got the franchise agreement signed. I was able to secure the financing myself because it was back when they were giving money out to anyone with a pulse. And uh, yeah, in 2000, unfortunately, in 2008, we opened and then 2008 happened. So that was a rough go in the beginning, but yeah, it's working out pretty well. We got two locations. One's like a stone's throw from GC and uh, the other one is on the other side of Roselle. The, yeah. There's something to be said, whether it be franchise, real estate investing, if you're a lender, an agent, if you got into the game in 07, right? Like yeah. right, when you got in, when things were as tough as they can be, I personally, like I was doing lending at that point and it was, I just didn't know any better. Right. I didn't know that there were good times. I just knew For like, Oh, first. this is really tough. Like the, the odds of you making it, I feel are just like astronomically higher than someone who started in 2000, whatever. Well, for the first right. eight, for the first 18 months of our existence, we were the only shop open in a plaza of 18. So <laughs> there's 17 vacancies in us in a new construction. So no one knew how to get in and out. There was still stuff covering the manholes. So there was like giant puddles you had to go through when it was raining out. There was construction behind us. So it was, uh, it was very trying. And, you know, I was young and, you know, learning on the fly and, uh, it definitely was an experience and it was a useful experience, you know, well, for anyone out there, uh, exploring, uh, franchises, any high level advice or any red flags about a franchise you might share that, uh, they, they might consider in their journey, go visit the store and go visit multiple stores to see how they run. You know, when I went to orientation way back in the day, there was a guy who at orientation, that was the first Jimmy John sandwich he ever had. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, how in the world do you get into this without ever trying the product or anything? You know, he's never been to one. This is the first time I was, I was shocked. So go do your due diligence, check out how the operations work, what they tell you, you know, be careful of what they tell you, you know, they're going to try and project it in the best light possible, but do your due diligence and look around and look up, you know, stuff and look at the star when they have like the amount you make every year, there's a little star next to it. See what that star says on the bottom of the page, because it usually tells you where those numbers came from. Uh, I, I imagine. So uh, Jimmy John's is a pretty tested, tried and true product here mm -hmm. in the Chicago market, but I, I always see franchise opportunities for like something that's not tested here in the Midwest or, or a, a new concept. And, and it's like, there's no discounts for that. So that's such, it seems like so much riskier when it's something oh, that's yeah. not it's, it's tough on the East coast, you know, when they have, you know, Jimmy Johnson had a rough time on the East coast and it's because everyone has like, you know, my uncle's sandwich shop on the corner here, you know, they all have like their own grinders, the yeah. grinders out there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's all like they have their friend's shop, their family shop that you go into for decades and it's just been a tough go, but I think they are finally starting to make some headway over there. So that's good. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to move on to uh, your, 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 your day job, your, yeah. your tax advisor job, your accounting job, the exciting part. So uh, first and foremost, just high level, like why'd you get into the, the accounting space? What motivated you there? Is it family? It was my family. My dad's been doing this and I think this is his 46th year in business. And nice. he actually, I think still has a couple clients from his first year in business, which is pretty crazy. And uh, you know, when I was running the Jimmy John's, and I realized, you know, I have this going, you know, I could easily get a manager to run it and then I can go and do something else. And I was like, you know, my dad has spent all this time and there's a real value to the experience and the history that, you know, he has there. You know, you don't see many companies that are in business for 46 plus years and you don't get that. So I felt like it was a good time for me to come in and try and modernize the practice. You know, we got a lot more digital. We, you know, do our best to try and facilitate all that stuff. And it was, I think, a good good parlay. So I had the experience from the Jimmy Johns. I knew how to work the business world. I taught myself QuickBooks. 
all that stuff. And then I went on and learned taxes and financial and all that stuff. If, if it wasn't the accounting route, what route would you have been growing up? What were you thinking you're going to be astronaut? <sighs> you know, I really, I, I would have loved to have been a pilot. You know, I, uh, I love flying. I love airplanes. Uh, I, I didn't realize at the time how, how tough it would have been, you know, flying, being gone like four days a week. But I really think I may have gone down that. And I also did like, you know, architecture, even though, again, I feel like that's a lot more technical than I assumed it was, but probably something like that. Nice. Nice. Just curious. That was more of my, that was even on the plan to ask. Just curious. Uh, yeah. I love asking people time. I don't know if you've ever done it, but I love asking people what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, so it kind of always reflecting on what, what they want to be versus the conversation I'm having with them today. So every time I hire or interview somebody for a job, I always ask that question. <laughs> what, uh, so we're, it's, it's, we're filming this uh, middle January. It's probably air start of February. You know, what's new this year? What, what are people that are filing taxes going to have to look out for in general? And then we'll kind of dive specifically into first time uh, real estate owners. Uh, what's different as far as compared to the previous years? Yes. Anything different that people have to look out for that, uh, that is just, uh, uh, we want to get out, get out there right away. So right now, this year, you should be expecting a lower refund, first of all, because in the years 2020 and 2021, Congress expanded you know, a lot of credits to help people with COVID-19 to make it easier on the families. But they didn't make those changes permanent. So for instance, the child tax credit in 2021 was $3,600 a kid. Now in 22, it's only $2,000 a child. The child independent care credit is for taxpayers who need care for family while they're at work, went from a total of maximum $8,000 for 21. Now it's down to $2,100 for 22. Also charitable deductions, you were able to take $300 even if you took the standard deduction. Now you're only able to deduct charities if you itemize your deductions. So it's important to know because a lot of people really rely on their tax ref refund to like fund their holiday spending or a trip they took during the holidays. So if it's not there, you kind of got to budget and see where you're at. And also if you file for an extension, you know that only gives you more time to file your taxes. So if you're expecting a refund, but you actually owe money, you might be on the hook for a penalty and interest. <clears throat> So you still, so I know most entrepreneurs out there, they file for the extension, they're, even though they're having more time uh, legally to file without getting in trouble, they're still accumulating interest if they do owe money, correct? Yeah, penalty and interest. So they want, the IRS wants their money, you know, in real time almost. So you make quarterly payments, that's where they want. And if you pay after the fact, after December 31st, you know, they're going to charge you penalty and interest. Awesome. Awesome. Love the IRS. Cool. So you know, I know there's some changes this year with third-party platforms like uh, Zelle and, and a couple of those other uh, you know, places you might send your friends money or collect money for your small business. Talk to us about kind of some of those changes uh, that you're seeing happening uh, this year that weren't around. Yeah. So like you said, third-party payment is Venmo, QuickPay, uh, Cash App, all that stuff. So say you are a photographer, you know, home inspector, any of those people where you go out to dinner and split the bill and you get paid via one of these third-party apps. If It got actually got delayed for this year. So this is for 2023, but you may still get a 1099K for 2022 because a lot of the companies had this already going. Gotcha. So if you make more than $600 on these apps, they're going to send you a 1099K and that's just going to report the income you made. So the way you want to report that is if it's a business and you're using that as payment for your business, you just report it on your Schedule C as income. So easy enough. If you sold something for a profit, I'm going to use the example of Bears tickets, but I don't think anyone sold those for a profit this year. Uh, they, you know, you would put that in your Schedule D for capital gains. And most likely, if you did sell Bears tickets, you sold them for a loss this year. And there's a few different ways to write off the loss that you get, but that does not offset income. So if you lost like three thousand dollars on your season tickets for your Bears, that does not offset any income for you. You just have to report it on your tax return. So if you're collecting rent through Zelle right now, or QuickPay Zelle, um, the, there's a good chance you're going to get uh, a 1099 in the, in the mail then. And, and, that's, and that's not addition to what, as long as you're reporting your income properly, that you, that you, you so when you get a 1099 like that, do you have to have like a separate line item that comes in on a rental income or can that just be grouped within, if you know, if maybe you collected 10,000 
through Zelle, but you collected 20,000, you just record 20. Like, is that, is that a separate line item altogether for these? Well, that's, that's why they delayed it an extra year because they kind of put this in last minute. It was all kind of mixed up as to how people were reporting because there are so many different ways that people were getting money from this. So they needed to clarify it. So if you are getting rent, you know, you just put it on your schedule E and that's how you report your 1099K income. So if you ever get audited or they ask, be like, see, here's my 1099K, here's my income. It, it matches. So that's what you would do with that. Got it. Mike, going back to just one thing that's changed, our standard deductions up just because you know everything's higher right now, right? Did yeah. that bump up from 2021 to 2022? Standard deductions have increased with uh, inflation. So the tax brackets, like the actual percent, the tax brackets have not increased. Just the, um, what? I'm sorry, what was the question again? The standard deduction. Standard deduction. Yeah, the uh, standard deduction did go up for inflation. Yeah. Got it. So just at a high level, tax the brackets are the same, right? Like the same dollar amount puts you in you know bracket at this percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The tax but you do you do pick up a little bit in the amount of the standard deduction. Is that yeah, so they did account for inflation in those this year? Okay. Anything worth noting, or is it just kind of you know, no, just just small increases, nothing, nothing crazy. Got it. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's say I may, you know, I, I have a W-2. I work a full-time job. I have, you know, two, three units. What are some things, you know, I have my profit and loss from the building, right? I have all the expenses from my maintenance guy, the expenses from any utilities in my name. I have all those standard things covered. What are some things that I should be aware of and make sure that I'm getting, you know, I am maximizing my my return or the amount I have to pay? What are some things that usually get forgotten for someone who is, you know, not a professional real estate investor, but does have a few rentals? Yeah. So common missed expenses, you know, a lot of people don't realize they're using their cell phone, you know, for business use. So you're talking to your tenant, you're talking to your repair people, you're talking to the village, talking to your property manager, whatever it is. So you'll be able to write off a portion of your of your cell phone bill. And also office expenses. You need to go make copies at Kinko's or FedEx office, whatever it's called now. You know, that's deductible mileage to and from your unit to go, you know, check it out, to go collect rent, to go make repairs. And uh, also a big one that surprisingly a lot of people forget when they uh, do their taxes by themselves or they have an inexperienced tax advisor is they forget to actually depreciate their property. So that's a big one. So those are some big things that people miss. Yeah, people actually really forget to do the depreciation. <laughs> yeah. More than you would think. You know, I'm trying to cost like every building I have. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, it's definitely, I mean, we've definitely seen it. And it's just some people just plug and chug and don't even really think about it. I'll I'll come clean on this. I I, I said that uh in shock, but I just thought about the and maybe like 2013 or something like that. I forgot to add an entire property we bought to my tax return one year and didn't come up to the next year when I'm like, why don't you get this one on the list? And she's like, you gave it to me last year. So we, uh, um, <laughs> on our client, on our client checklist, we have a section where it says got married, had a baby, bought a house because people will frequently forget they, you know, they had a baby during the tax year. You know, they, you know, automatically think that yeah, the baby's one, really you know, 14 room. months now. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, oh, yeah, well, we had the kid we, since last time we talked to you, but they, a lot of them forget. So that's why we have to add that section to our checklist. Yeah, we were buying hundreds of properties at the time. So I just screwed up on my list oh, yeah. um, on a one or two. Like, yeah, that, 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 we got to make sure we catch that. W- what is the uh, difference? You have the tax professional, I don't know if I'm saying this right, designation. I always hear people talking about that. And then you have, you could do all these other, right? What's the big difference or the main difference in having that? First off, tell us, explain to us what that is and make sure I'm saying it right. And then kind of going uh, to the differences, if you don't mind. Yeah. So basically, you're talking about rental activity. So you have three main types. You have passive, active, and what's called real estate professional. Passive activity is for people who make over $150,000. And the losses you have on your rental from that only offset passive gains. So there's really no benefit like in that immediate tax year when you're a pad when you have passive activity. The benefit comes when you go to sell your property. All those uh, expenses that were deferred can now be taken upon the sale of your house. So that's how they get the benefits for that. The uh, no, the next one is called active, which is anyone who makes less than $100,000 can deduct a maximum of $25,000 in real estate losses. And this begins to phase out between $100,000 and $150,000. 
And uh, it's the same thing. They get between 100 and 150, they get less and less of that $25,000 until they break that barrier of 150. Then they go to passive. So for that, for an example, say you made $75,000 on earned income on your W-2. You had real estate losses, you know, rental property losses of 15,000. You're only going to pay tax on $60,000 a year earned income because that $15,000 reduces your earned income. Got it. So Mike, just real quick though, to kind of re- restate that another way, you made 175 grand on your W-2. You had real estate losses of 15K. Your basis is still 175. Is that correct? That 15K can only go against other, other knock out other real estate gains. If you have one clunker and three good properties or whatever. Correct. Yes. Got it. Yep. And then the next one, most advantageous is the real estate professional status. And this one, you really got to talk to your tax advisor and make sure you qualify for it because it has big advantages. But if they, if they come talking to you, the IRS comes talking to you, it could, it could be bad. But this one allows you to use all your losses against your earned income. And there's two qualifications you need. The first one is you need to have 750 hours in real estate professional activities. So you basically got to be deciding, you know, who your tenant is, deciding who's doing the repairs, stuff like that. And you need to spend more time doing real estate professional activities than anything else. So say the average full-time job is 2,080 hours a year. You need to be working 2,081 hours a year in real estate professional activities to be claiming that which is 80 hours a week, which is very difficult to do. So once you qualify, you must prove that you materially participate in that activity. And that's a little, I feel, detailed for this. So if you want to, you can Google those seven steps for real estate professional status for material participation, but you only have to qualify for one of those seven steps in order to show they materially participate. And the most important thing for a real estate professional status is a document. So yeah, document, 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 everything. So what you need on the documentation is the date, you need the property address, you need the activity that you did, and then the time spent doing it. And that can be recorded on like a spiral notebook. It can be on an Excel spreadsheet that you update whenever you do it. And I know they have apps that do this as well, but the thing is you can't mix and match. You can't do like a month on paper, a couple months on Excel, you know, try the app out for a month. So it's gotta be consistent because that's what they wanna see. But again, and you have to do that if you did uh, for an, each of those activities for an hour each, you'll have 750 uh, log entries, like or whether you're writing it, like that, that's yeah. now who, who's that going to, is that going to submit it directly to the IRS? Is that through someone like yourself? If, tax if and only if you are audited, correct? Yes. Yeah, only if you're audited, you need to show them proof. So uh, you hold that, you don't submit that with your tax return. That just goes in your file on your computer that says 2021 tax return or whatever year it is. So do you, you have to do that every single year, like yeah. have that, or is, or is this, you have to requalify or can you do 750 and then do, and then be like good for. You can change. So if you qualify one year, you can go to, you know, passive next year or whatever, but you definitely, in order to do it, you do need to qualify every year for it. You need to do the 750 hours and all that. Mark, you've been a real estate professional for like a decade. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I, you know, it, it's funny because it's like when it's just been something for like, no, it's been 20 years now. Like when you're just something for 20 years, like you don't even realize how you got to that, I guess, like, uh, or the barriers to get to it now. So that's something on an annual basis. So what, what's something like, you know, you know, you have people that are working full-time jobs or whatever, and they're, they're running flips or doing stuff at nights and weekends. Like that, that's something that they should be doing is, is documenting this. So they could say this at, in every April, like, well, they wouldn't be a real estate professional yeah. because unless they worked more hours in their real estate than their W2 job. Oh, so, I, okay. I missed that. I, I did hear you say that, but I missed it. So, okay. So they have to actually um, exceed their, their day job. It almost, it, it really, it's written out for people that are doing this full-time, right? Am, am I understanding that right? Full time, or if you know, say a spouse is a stay at home, you know, watches over the kids and they do the real estate activity, they would only need to show they did 750 hours. You know, they don't need to surpass or do anything else because they don't have any other job. So, as long as you know, that spouse shows that they can prove that they did the 750 hours, they should qualify. So, they're doing 14 and a half hours basically a week of real estate activity as a stay at home spouse. That will allow them as a couple to uh, qualify underneath that. Right. Once one spouse qualifies, it goes for the couple if you're married filing jointly. It's a big deal. I mean, so I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole here, but we, we did an episode with Cost Seg Kev, and we can link to it in the show notes on just cost segregation. I don't want to take us down this huge rabbit hole. But one thing I learned was from going from W2 to real estate professional, 
that's when you get that bang, right? Because you can take all that accelerated depreciation mm-hmm. against all, you know, for me personally, a, a ton of short-term capital gains from the flips where I couldn't do that previously. And then I think this is where if, I'm bringing this up because let's say you're investing in a deal. You, know, you have a syndicator and you you put 50 grand in the deal, 100 grand in the deal. And he's saying, hey, we're going to cost seg this. You need to understand like, yeah, that might be great for him and other real estate professionals in the deal. And, and might keep me honest here, but those accelerated gains, they won't hurt or really help you because you can only... You, it can only knock off other passive income that you earned. That's you can't right. take that giant loss to offset other income, like from your Jimmy John's franchise or from whatever. Correct. Yeah, you got that right. Yeah. So just it's something. It, you know, if you have multiple people in deals, they get affected differently, and you need to understand how it affects you personally. So I guess yeah. that's that's like my public service announcement before taking us down a huge rabbit hole. No, that, that, that's that's such awesome information. Uh, so wait, Tom, just when you. Uh, went full-time real estate, like this is something that you, you went down, you, you had to work with your tax advisor and, and go through all that and document and track it all, right? That's what you did? Yeah. And, and admittedly, I'm not like the world's greatest at tracking, but besides like, you know, I, I have high level notes for each week and it, it is what you right. You can, you can easily come up with, if you're spending 2,200 hours or whatever, it's like, okay, if I have seven, seven, 750 documented is, is simple. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, for, for any IRS agents listening, I mean, I imagine like you just your track record, like if you're doing X amount of deals a year, like you could back into that all day. There's kind of got to be some sort of common sense approach to document that even if you had to go back and do it. Correct. And, you know, that's what the other thing he says, like, well, just go, like you put everything in your calendar. You can always go back there if you missed anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it, taxes no one thinks about, but like it, for me, it's, it was very eye opening because you get hammered on these flips. Like it's, you know, flipping is the worst thing from a, from a tax perspective. Like they, they hammer you on those. And then I would have like these rental properties, but I, without doing the cost, I couldn't, I couldn't use any losses from that to offset the flips before getting to this status. And that, and that was a very big game changer for me. Yeah. That status is huge. So if you can do it, you got to make sure that you qualify and continue to qualify for it. Yeah. (laughs) So, so it, let me ask you a question. Talk to, everything I said, talk to someone like Mike. Don't take, let's just get that disclaimer out there. Definitely talk to a tax advisor before yeah. you do anything like that. This is why I love this podcast. The stuff we get to learn on here, just uh, um, bringing awesome people like Mike on here. So as far as uh, losses rolling forward, you know, I, I know for me, I've had uh, extreme losses in here, mostly around like developing and, and all the write-offs you do when you're buying, doing hundreds of properties at a time. Um, those losses have rolled forward. What is that only because I have that uh, that that third option as far as being a, a tax professional, or is that can you get losses that roll forward on 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 uh, your income on your years on the other two? Uh, if it's passive, you know, if you're in the passive, you make over one hundred fifty thousand a year. It would only offset passive gains. So if you had like, like a great year in the stock market or something like that, it would offset those. But yeah, I mean, you're only really taking advantage of if you're a real estate professional. Gotcha. So that's probably why I was able to truly take advantage of it. So cool. All right. Let's go to uh let's go to a couple of different things. Schedule E, right? We we use that to report income and expenses. This is also, if I'm thinking about this correctly, what a lender is going to look at and you know, when they want to see the production of property. You mentioned the phone, you mentioned office. Was there anything else that we should be T- touching base on here. Well, you mentioned three different classes. Mm-hmm. They're just pulling us back a step. Was there anything else that, you know? Well, there's one thing um, it's called the de minimis safe harbor. So what that is, is say you do like, you know, a bathroom remodel for $15,000 or something like that. You would normally have to depreciate that for the number of years. But under this de minimis safe harbor, if you ask for an itemized invoice from your contractor and you say like, the tub is a thousand bucks. The vanity is like six hundred dollars. Tiles two thousand dollars. Anything under twenty five hundred dollars, you can write off as an expense. So you don't need to depreciate it. So you do need to add a statement to your tax return. This is a mouthful, but it needs to be stated on your tax return. You are electing to use the de minimis safe harbor from section one point two six three a dash one f one i i d. So please tell me you had that written down there. You just yeah, didn't, you remember no, it. I, I had that written down there. <laughs> that thing is, uh, and it's all uppercase and lower. It's, it's, it's a lot, but 
I mean, that's a pretty big thing, you know, instead of depreciating, only taking like a chunk of it every year, you can write off a lot of those expenses, like the year they occur. Dude, if I had a bar or a Harbor or a bar or restaurant on the Harbor, I'm naming it the minimum safe Harbor. Just sounds good. <laughs> Bunch of accountants hanging out there. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Tom. Um, have you ever went to buy a building and asked the seller for their schedule E? No. I mean, keep in mind, I'm working on, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm buying is mom and pops, like, you know, cash as is like most of my stuff is not going to be the traditional here. Usually when we get the rent rolls um, and you know, the actuals for utilities, that's usually enough actual leases. I'm comfortable. We, we manage uh, in the last year. I don't know if this is a new thing. I might maybe you speak to it, but in the last year, you know, we manage these large, some of these large, when I say large properties, they say call it 15 to 30 type units. And, you know, they might be for sale and they've came back and asked for the schedule E and they're, they're performing properties. There's no ad value. They're just buying them at a four or five or six uh, cap. So they're, they're coming back as part of the turn review, asking for a, a copy of the schedule E for the last three years, whatever. So I was curious to see if you've ever came across that. Yeah. People, people want to see that because you're not likely to lie in your tax return. Just like people when you buy and sell a business, you know, you want to see your sales tax reports to see what you're actually reporting as sales. You know? Yeah. I guess I, the, the, the other devil's advocate to that would be like, if I know the gross income and I know what those set expenses are, like you're not going to operate the building the same way that guy did. And you're going to know that he may have capital expenditure or he may have deferred it. Like it's kind of like the eye test there that like, you can't just take those numbers, plug them into a spreadsheet and say, cool, we're good to go. Yeah. So, um, all right. So I got a bunch of Mark, I know we have an outline here. I got a bunch of just random one-off facts or questions. Can I just start firing those off or where, where, where do I, uh, take it's all you, man. <laughs> Mike looks like he's well, ready. We're for... just peppering you with, this is like when we go to dinner, we just pepper you with random stuff here. All right, so here's see. an interesting one that I think applies to, to people. This came up with, you know, I brought this up to my accountant. So from my understanding is, man, I'm going to butcher this and you, you correct me. But, you know, I, I have four kids. I can, if they do work for me, so they, they do cleanouts for me, they do the mail, like they put in a few hours here and there, right? Up yeah. to like, I, whatever the number is, you can pay them. And if it's under a certain threshold, then, you know, you're paying them. They're not paying, it's an expense to you, but they're not paying tax on it. You can put it directly into an IRA, a Roth or an IRA or something and help them down the road. And, you know, it's a little, it's a little bit to save on taxes, my understanding though was like you actually need to be set up in payroll and there's a few things stopping me from doing it. But can you back us out of my rambling and talk through this? So what that is, is, you know, someone like you, who you know, their kids do a little help here and there. That is a way to shift income, you know, from the taxpayer to their kids, where if you make under 12,000 a year, you don't pay a tax on it. So, so let's say I pay my kids five grand total, right? I, I give them each a grand, there's four of them. Mm. Now I know why you have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the one thing to watch out for, though, is say like someone's saying like uh, my three year old is like modeling in the apartment uh, when you take pictures. You know, they <laughs> you have to be able to prove that your kid was actually doing the work and that that is the going rate for whatever they were doing. Got so it. You can't say my kid was sweeping and I paid him ten thousand dollars because then you got to show, hey, this guy offered to sweep, <laughs> but you know so. It is something that you can do and what we have done, but you just have to be careful not to just say, I paid my my kids, all four of them, $11,999. And they all just swept and cleaned apartments for me because you're going to have a tough time proving that if you ever you know get called on it. So 12,000 so is, 12, is the number. Where does that, where do you put, have to put it to? Or how do you pay them? It's the max. Yeah. The what that what are you doing with that money? That. You said something about putting in a, a Roth. So you're taking and, and paying it to them through a Roth, you said? Well, that you for a Roth, you have to show that you have income. So they would most likely get a W-2 his kids. And so then you can set up a Roth like that. So the money, like the money basically becomes tax-free at that point. Gotcha. Right. That's like cool. like it, I get to write off as an expense to the business, but they don't have to pay income on what they earned. And then we can defer it by putting it into a Roth. But right. again, like it has to be legit wages. Like the number is not 12 grand. It's like a, between all four of them, it's a total of like $800, right? Like, cause that, I mean, you're going to, yeah. I mean, and then by the time I do all the paperwork and all the BS around it, like I'm, I'm just netting zero <laughs> and waste a lot of time. Like, you know, teenagers who help out at like the office or like, you're going to be pretty hard up to find a job that's going to like, 
a six-year-old can do that you would pay him ten thousand dollars for it you know got it but when you have you know someone like you said a teenager helping with the phones or whatever like all of a sudden this yeah. you know summer job they come in and bang out three months of work this becomes something that people should have on their radar. this is applicable to somebody listening yeah yeah it definitely is i'm sure people out there listening are actually doing it right now but this is something that you should definitely talk to your tax advisor about before you know taking taking it on. Definitely talk to them. All right, cool. So now another crazy one for you. So another one I've seen recently. This got brought up uh, actually Nick Yesen, who was on you know an episode probably four or five ago. He was the one who brought it up to me. He was talking about making purchasing a building, and when you make that purchase to keep your basis down you have the sales of goods sold and then the building price. So let's say a building is $2 million, but instead of buying it for 2 million, you buy it for 1.8 and then the cost of goods sold. So I don't know what you can legally put in there, like appliances, appliances, right. things that are not detached, I believe it, you know, is the real number, like not fudging it, but like, let's say that's 200 K. And then he does that somehow that is helpful to taxes and keeping the basis down. You know, I'm Hogwash, is that anything worth discussing? I don't know if it's hogwash, but I've never personally heard of it. So it could be like a very advanced tax strategy that we just haven't come across yet. But, you know, I personally have not heard of that before. Got it. Mark, any any relevance here to you? No, I'm, I'm just adding up in a, in a big building how many sets of blinds are at 50 bucks a, a pop. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that, that's I, I, so I've heard, I believe, I believe actually uh, this is where it comes from. I believe is it keeps your city transfer tax down. It's off that 1.8 number instead of the two. Yeah. And then also your reflection of, uh, taxes for, for tax appeal as well too, buying it for less. Now I've heard this in the residential world, you know, many times, uh, if you're going to, someone's trying to sell a house, uh, and that they, they move to California, and they want their furniture, they'll, the family will write a check for five grand for all the furniture. Uh, they have the option of kind of including it all in their mortgage, but they'll write the check for the five grand for the furniture and, and just get a mortgage on the rest of the house to keep it out of that, that taxable, uh, the, just the tax rate to, from keeping the basis low. Mm. Cool. Mike, what are some other things, whether you're a real estate professional or not, but other things people should be thinking about, or maybe they're already doing, but not capitalizing on. So this could be, you know, if, if you are self-employed, a self-employed IRA, if you're saving for a 529B, like what are some of the things that people might be doing and not realizing or not maximizing them on their tax returns? What are some that you commonly see with your clients? Well, I would say, you know, sole proprietors are a big one. People who file a Schedule C, you know, like carpenters or plumbers who work for themselves, kind of just go and do it. They uh, So a Schedule C is the reporting of income or loss on your tax return. And it's for the business of a sole proprietor. And what a business is, is that activity, its main purpose is to generate income or profit from. So when you make profit on a Schedule C, you got to pay federal tax, you got to pay state tax, and you got to pay self-employment tax, which is your Social Security and Medicare, and you're playing, paying both the, the employee and the employer portion, which equals 15.3%. So some common missed things that people always forget to put on are health insurance. You know, if you're paying your health insurance yourself, you can deduct your health insurance, your vision insurance, your dental insurance, right on the Schedule C. And also, people also miss the office and home. And there's two methods to do the office and home. The first one is a percent method. Method. So you take, say, 30% of your house is your office. So 30% of all your expenses in that house are going to be associated to your office. So you got 30% of your utilities, your uh, internet, your uh, mortgage, all that stuff. The problem with that is you have to recapture that upon the sale of your house. And you have to keep all the records, you gotta keep more documentation. It's just much more complicated to do. What a majority of our clients do is what's called the simplified method. And that gives you uh, an expense of up to $1,500. There's no documentation needed. There's no recapture when you sell your house and it's much easier to do. It's basically just a checkbox you put in. I have 300 square foot office in my house and it gives you the $1,500 expense. And that's uh, definitely the better way to do it. And then here's some things not to do on a Schedule C that we've definitely seen done. So if you make income, say you make $60,000, don't make one expense for $60,000. <laughs> definitely don't do that. That's going to be a big red flag. Also, don't make a dummy Schedule C. So if you, may, if you have earned income and stuff, 
don't just make a schedule C with no income and a bunch of expenses just so you can reduce your taxable income. Don't, don't do that. And on the flip side of that, if you didn't make income, you most likely probably had expenses associated with making that income. So take those expenses, you know, document them, but be sure you're taking those expenses because we see a lot of people who, you know, have done it themselves or had someone do their tax return, who, like their uncle or something, and they don't put any expenses on their Schedule C. So you're just throwing money down the drain. So those are some things that we see. Yep. N- another one, uh, as this is like the time of the year for it, I'm kind of jumping around here, but let's say you have, you know, I pay, I pay a lot of contractors, pay a lot of subs. We have private investors that sometime lend that we pay them, you know, talk to us about legally when you need to get, I believe it's 1099s, not K1s. When do we need to get those out? What needs to be on those? How do you track them? Just give us the one-on-one for someone who might've, this might've been their first year scaling and having to, to get those out for their business. So 1099s need to go out by January 31st. And depending on how you pay it or what you did, it's most likely going likely to be a 1099, 1099 NEC. They got away from the 1099 miscellaneous. That's for rent and other things. So you would need to issue them a 1099 NEC. And there's, I know QuickBooks does it electronically, and there's a host of other programs you can do it electronically. And if you do it by paper, you need to have the red ink on the uh, 1096 and the copy A, which You'll see if you go to like, you know, Office Max, they have like the three part little thing you can grab and pop it in your printer and do. So, yeah, definitely mail them out by uh, the 31st. And that goes for W-2s as well. Got it. And then what, I'm assuming there's just a penalty for being late there. Um, I believe there is. We've never seen one. I mean, we issue 1099s when clients come in. And then they ask like if we haven't talked to them and it's like June and they're like, hey, we need 1099s. We give it to them. We send them out. Um, It's really the main people who are going to give you the issues are the people receiving the 1099s because until they receive their last 1099, they can't file their tax return. So it's really, I mean, we have not seen a uh, fine with handing out late 1099s. You got it, but you're going to piss off the people that have been good to you all year. Yeah. Because they need that information. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Mark, what do you got? Well, I was to say, yeah, I know there's in September they had, and I might say this wrong, the uh, renewable tax credit that is out there. And I think there's like windows on there, like anything that in 2023, uh, real estate investors here in Chicago should take advantage of. Uh, yeah, that, that's out so, there. This is more so that there's a train going by here. So, all right. It's funny because we're right by each other. So I hear it too. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting right down the street here. There might be two of them now. Okay. So for the residential energy credit, there's no changes for tax year 22. These changes go in effect from 2023 to 2032, and they phase out in 2034. So the biggest main difference is before you were only able to take a lifetime credit of $500. So that means you replace windows in your house one time, $500, you're done. Now you can take a maximum of $1,200 per year. So that's huge, you know, and that's a credit right there. So unfortunately, you can't use it on rentals, but there's a strategy where how this can be useful. Say, you know, my house, I need to replace the windows. Instead of replacing whatever 15 windows in my house, I can replace three of them a year and I can take advantage of like the $600 savings that Windows gives you every year. So there's no lifetime limit to that. But there are different items and different amounts that you can get the credit for. So you definitely got to talk to your tax advisor and see what qualifies and how much it's for. Got it. No. Cool. So we're talking about, you know, after this is all great stuff for when you get all your information to your, you know, tax professional, to your accountant, but taking it a step back, do you have recommendations on software or ways to keep your profit and loss? Let's say you have just a couple buildings, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, is that QuickBooks? Is that something that you see on spreadsheets? Like, what would you say is a best practice for someone who is, you know, not, you know, not build, not doing out a building or app folio, but just kind of getting started? You know, if you only have a handful of properties, there's nothing wrong with just doing a spreadsheet, you know, on Excel, you know, because you're going to have what, five, six expenses a month, maybe, you know, it's, it's not going to be hard to do. And you'll have your bank statements to back it up. And we have plenty, we have a lot of people who handwrite it still, you know, they give you sheets of paper. 
and they just write, you know, X property and then here's the rent and then here's my expenses for the year. So, you know, it's something you can tally up at the end of the year if you want to, but there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as it's documented and uh, it's legible. Cool. What is the, uh, what's the first day? And by the time Sarah's, it'll probably come out. What's the first day people can file for taxes? Is that day? Uh, January 23rd, I believe they just announced. All right. So January 23rd, what that means for all you uh, landlords that have tenants that are behind, usually the tenants that are behind are the first ones running to get their tax return filed. So make sure in your payment or collection plan right now, make sure you're, you're planning on uh, them turning some of that over to you to, to catch up if you have anyone that's in arrears. That's my public service announcement. <laughs> that's a good one. Cool. Mark, anything else? Are we good to wrap here? No, nah, that's awesome. Mike, that, that is awesome, man. Um, yeah. You know, you are uh, active uh, locally here in Chicago market, real estate investor yourself. Uh, you have, uh, you know, people can reach out to you and I'm excited. I got a couple of ideas of things we can put on the website as well, following up the show. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on here. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate you guys having me. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the wrap up, man. Let's do it. All right. So what, Mike, what's your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do this while so many others wish they could? Well, my, uh, I'd say my competitive advantage is, you know, I'm a tax advisor, but I'm also a small business owner. So I know what it's like to make $50,000. I also know what it's like to lose $50,000. So when I'm talking to clients and they're like, I'm not having a great time. I've lost a lot of money. I understand, you know, I've been there and I give them suggestions based on experience and knowledge of being in the business, not just looking at a profit and loss. And uh, I would say that would be the competitive advantage. Walk the walk. I love it. There you go. All right. So putting on your investor hat, what is the one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in the Chicagoland area? I would say first educate yourself, but then just do it. You know, my, uh, I'm going to use an example of when I got my license, my driver's license, you know, when you're driving, getting your permit, you have your parents in your car, you have the instructor in the car and you're going through the motions, but you know, someone's watching out for you. You know, but the minute you get your driver's license and you take your parents' car for the first time, that's the time where I learned the most about how to drive. You know, when there was no one there to back you up, to watch out. And that's the same thing with buying real estate. You know, you just got to educate yourself, but you just got to do it because you're never going to learn more than when you're actually doing it and, you know, actively investing in real estate. Awesome. I like that analogy, except <laughs> I am a terrible driver. <laughs> It's they have this stat, like everyone is, uh, everyone says they're above 50% drive, like, you know, 80% of people say they're above 50%. Like everyone has a better perception of himself. I know I'm in the bottom 10. <laughs> I, I know where I belong. All right. Awesome. Mike, what do you do for fun? Um, I hang out a lot with my wife and kids. I coach my kids soccer team this year. So I uh, think I might need to start learning how to be a better coach. So we'll see if the, the team, <laughs> the team was okay. We had, we had to make some improvements, but it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, we like to go to air shows and probably at least once one of them a, a summer. And my daughter now wants to be a Thunderbird pilot. So that's kind of terrifying. And uh, I also like a good audio book and I like TV shows. You know, my favorite ones right now are Yellowstone and Tulsa King. I don't know if you guys watch those, but I would highly recommend those. That came up the last week. Uh, that came up last week. So I, I do got to give it a shot now. Which one? Yeah. The yellow sounds good. You know, don't, don't feel bad. I, I fired myself from being a soccer coach. I, I was, I can't, I, I was horrible at it. And I found a really good coach and put and helped him get on a really good team. <laughs> and he's actually taken off in his soccer career ever since. Uh, well, so. the thing is like when you're coaching like five-year-olds, like I didn't like when you got like eight of them, like they don't listen to you. You know, it's kind of like a mob mentality. They do what they want and they like, I don't, I don't get it. So we tried and we, uh, and I'm pretty sure some of the other towns may have been juicing with older kids. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, you mentioned audiobooks. Give us a good book, podcast, or self development activity you'd recommend to our listeners. My favorite book is a book called The Wealthy Gardener by John Seforic. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but I have not. It, yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, it's it's a personal finance book, but it has like an interesting story like weaved in. So they kind of go back and forth on the story. They give you like a ton of great quotes. It's a great book if you like that type of stuff. And uh, they have like a companion website. It's all free. They're not trying to sell you any like classes or, you know, buy this or that. So it's just a really good book. The uh, If you listen to it on the audio book, the person who reads it, very pleasing to listen to. So it's just overall, you know, I can't really recommend that book enough. I always do the uh, the test for the audio books because I, I do, 
I, if it's a long book, like if, in, if they don't have a good voice, like I, I struggle like to even listen to it. So I, oh I got to test it out. Yeah. All right. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Well, besides Mark, obviously, um, I would recommend first my real estate agent, Susan Camilleri, Remax Central here in Roselle, right down the road. Uh, my lawyer, Dave Schluter, Schluter Law Office in Itasca. And uh, my lender, Rick Tafel from Wintrust Mortgage out of Bloomingdale Bank. So all three, all actually all four of you guys are my team here when it comes to you know rental and investing and stuff. So I appreciate all you. Awesome. We're going to have to get awesome. their, their emails so we can link to them. Yeah, yeah. Alex, link, link to those in the show notes, please. So Mike, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Yeah. Uh, if they want to get a hold of me, they can check out my LinkedIn. They can go to our website, which is pfsgi.com. My email, which is map2 at pfsgi.com. Or give our office a call. Ask for Mike Jr. at number 630-924-2400. And uh, they can add value if they know of anyone who's in need of an experienced tax advisor. Uh, send them our way. We'll be more than happy to take care of them. All right. All right. You ready for the Chicago fact, Mark? Heck yeah. Chicago fact today, you know, we have it, uh, is Ryan worthy, Ryan worthy out of Evanston bought a t-shirt and, uh, something I realized here this week, you were joking about earlier. I was trying to joke about it, but, uh, you know, we underpriced our t-shirts. I think we actually lose a couple of bucks each time we, we sell them. So, uh, I think right now a t-shirt is like 10 bucks on our, on our merch store. So grab a t-shirt, you get entered into the, uh, Chicago fact and you can win a $50 gift card. So let's hear it, Tom. So our, our loss leader. Yeah, it's a loss leader. Yep. <laughs> All right. So Mike, you provide a ton of value from the accounting standpoint, your investor yourself, but we're going back to Jimmy John's here and let Mark get the first crack at this. So how many Jimmy John's are there within the city of Chicago? So like Mike's don't count within the city limits, how many Jimmy John's are there? And your options are 22, 44, 88, 176. Um, I'm going to say 88. Mike, what do you want to go with? I would agree with 88. Guys, it's 44. Oh, really? Yeah. You know what? I would have, I would have gone higher as well. We're a big city. Well, I was thinking, all right. So there's uh, uh, one in each. 77 uh, communities. Yeah, like, one yeah, in one each per... community, but a handful are not going to, but then you have others that'll have a bunch more. It's like, so I, I was trying to, like, I really thought 88 made sense. Oh, man. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, Ryan, we're going to we'll expand. Put... Ryan, we'll put your name back in there and uh, we do appreciate you buying a t-shirt and uh, others you can uh, check out our merch store as well too. So, all right. Another show that was awesome. Uh, you know, it, uh, you, Mike, you made accounting as fun as it could possibly be today. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. Mike, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you as always. Listeners, uh, check out our website. We have uh, added now uh, a whole different section on sponsorship. If you have an interest in sponsoring the show, we are excited to have that discussion. We have a few different options, very affordable, and uh, always looking just to bring more people onto the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast team and in the community. So thanks again, Mike. Thank you as always, Tom. Listeners, we'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. Thanks all.